My name is Simon Harrick, and I have the honor to be the director of the Marquette University Center for Peacemaking. And we have some wonderful people who have been working with, uh, with and for the center, along with me for a number of years. So I'm very glad. I wish I could share this the uh, stage with all of them. Uh, but I'm here actually to introduce our Marquette University Center for Peacemaking Peacemaker of the Year. Uh, Jim Douglas, the first time I heard of him, uh, he was in Rome at Vatican II. This was some 40 some odd years ago, 50 years ago. And he was um, and he was asking the bishops to put out a document that would condemn total war, which we were on the brink of in those days. And actually, he, along with Dorothy Day, was successful. And I asked Jim a couple of days ago, I said, Jim, how should I introduce you, really? I mean, you've done so many things. Uh, what should I say? I mean, am I going to talk about the time you went to Afghanistan to try to make peace over there? Or the time you went to Iraq right before the 1991 war, and you put your body between the Iraqis and the invading forces of the coalition to try to protect the Iraqi people from the invasion? Should I talk about that? No, he said. Uh, should I talk about the time, you know, we went to Palestine, Jim and I, and were arrested and beaten up and thrown in jail together? Uh, no, he said, don't talk about that. Um, <laughs> then, he said, uh, yeah, I rest, don't talk about that, that's kind of fun. And uh, about the time that he went, then he went to the West Coast and founded the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, mostly to protest the newly built Trident missile base out there, because one Trident missile uh, has something like you know a thousand times the, the power of uh, of Hiroshima. And Jim was protesting out there with a large community of nonviolent activists, uh, and then he protested the white train. Should I talk about no? I don't talk about that. Uh, should I tell you about uh, the fact that he then went to Birmingham, Alabama, and opened up a Catholic worker house called Mary House, which takes in people who are poor and homeless and sick, and he takes care of them. Um, he told me not to mention any of the awards he received, uh, like, uh, for example, the Pacham and Terrace Award. I'm not supposed to talk about that because uh, that's an award that he shared with John F. Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, Sergeant Shriver, the founder of the, of the Peace Corps, and Father Graffi from our place over here, and Helen Prejean, whom we had over here to welcome uh, a few years ago and give her, gave her an honorary degree here at Marquette. He shared that same award with Desmond Tutu and Mother Teresa. So he told me, don't mention any of that, he said. <laughs> Just tell them that I'm a Catholic worker trying to follow in the footsteps of the great Dorothy Day, and that I'm a writer. And, and what a writer. I, I remember that uh, I read his Nonviolent Cross, the Nonviolent Cross, Jim Douglas' Nonviolent Cross, 40 years ago, when I was 40 some odd years ago, when I was a novice. In, and I had been thinking about and reading about nonviolence, and then I read The Nonviolent Cross. And it was the first time uh, I began to understand that a nonviolent <coughs> life was possible. And not only was it possible, it was pretty darn exciting, too. So I decided, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this full time, this nonviolent <coughs> thing you know, that Jim is talking about. It wasn't until many years later that we met. But um, I guess the start of that journey finally ended up bringing me here to Marquette University and the Center for Peacemaking. So I'm glad to return the favor, and I hope that uh, you help me to welcome one of my old uh, teachers from way back, uh, our Marquette University Center for Peacemaking, Peacemaker of the Year, Jim Douglas. experiment in truth, so uh, to talk about Gandhi is an experiment in truth, and especially to talk about his assassination, which <coughs> I've only learned about in any um, detail recently, and I never planned to write about 
Gandhi's assassination, but you know, <laughs> you get turned in certain directions <coughs> and it becomes necessary to follow the way you're turned. Um, so this is maybe a beginning for me to try to share with you what I've learned on, on um, <coughs> our brother Mohandas. Um, Gandhi knew his assassins. I learned just how much he did know his assassins. He had encountered them in earlier attempts on his life. Gandhi knew in particular the spiritual leader behind his assassination a brilliant Indian thinker on revolutionary violence whom he had met in London four decades before. The story of Gandhi and his assassins <clears throat> gives us a lens with which to see our reality. We live in a world where assassination has become an unspeakable, nationally approved art to frustrate fundamental change in proudly democratic countries, ranging from India to the United States of America. When Gandhi visited London from South Africa in 1909, he learned how much a new generation of Indians was being drawn toward assassination and armed struggle as the only way for them to be liberated from the British. On July the 1st, 1909, London was shocked when Sir William Curzon Wiley, political aide to the Secretary of State for India, was shot to death by an Indian student. The murder took place at a lavish reception held by the National Indian Association at the Institute of Imperial Studies in the heart of London. The assassin was Madanlal Dingra, a recent engineering graduate from University College London. Dingra's motive was political. He had become a dedicated follower of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, a 26-year-old Indian philosopher of violent revolution and assassination. Savarkar was the leader of a cadre of militant Indian students living at a London hostel he ran, India House. He had molded Madanlal Dingra for months as an assassin. When Dingra succeeded in killing Wiley, Savarkar congratulated his jailed disciple on his achievement. He also used the condemned assassin as his shield and mouthpiece. On August the 18th, the day after Dingra's execution, Savarkar succeeded through friendly press contacts in getting the full text of what was known as Dingra's statement published in the London Daily News. Dingra is cited, is cited as saying, quote, I admit the other day I attempted to shed English blood as a humble revenge for the inhuman hangings and deportations of patriotic Indian youths. In this attempt I have consulted none but my own conscience. I have conspired with none but my own duty." Unquote. These words written by Savarkar defend the murder in the name of the man who pulled the trigger while at the same time covering up the author of the conspiracy, Savarkar himself. Gandhi could feel sympathy for Dingra not as an Indian nationalist hero, but as a man overcome by a destructive idea. Gandhi said, in my view, Mr. Dingra himself 
is innocent. The murder was committed in a state of intoxication. It is not merely alcohol that makes one drunk. A mad, a mad idea can also do so. That was the case with Mr. Dingra. Gandhi said he thought those who incited Dingra to act on the mad idea of liberation by assassination bore the major <coughs> responsibility for the act. On October the 24th, 1909, that fall, with the summer's assassination drama still in the air, Gandhi and Savarkar shared the same speaker's platform in London to present competing visions for India's future. The dinner was the idea of Savarkar's militant students from India House. They invited Gandhi into their lion's den, asking him to be their opening speaker, with Savarkar to follow. Gandhi, incidentally, gave us a condition of his coming that it be a vegetarian meal and that he be the cook. It's an interesting condition. And he enjoyed being with the students as they cooked together, and then he came out and put on his tie and gave his talk. Gandhi's talk drew on the classic Hindu epic, the Ramayana, as a vision of suffering for the truth. The epic's main characters, Gandhi said, showed the way to freedom through suffering. When Indians learn to live in that matter, manner, Gandhi said, they can from that instant count themselves as free. A people became free, Gandhi thought, in the present by suffering for the truth. They didn't have to wait for a colonial power to grant them freedom. A liberating, nonviolent means was already the end in the process of becoming. Savarkar drew a different lesson from the same story. Rama, he proclaimed, established his ideal kingdom, Raja Raj, only after slaying Ravana, the symbol of oppression and injustice. Slaying Ravana was to be taken literally. One destroyed evil by destroying the evildoer. <coughs> Savarkar's talk celebrated the fierce goddess Durga, the avenger, and the necessity of actually killing the evil one, Ravana. For the next four decades, Gandhi's and Savarkar's own lives would embody embody their diametrically opposed visions of social change, with both visions culminating finally in Gandhi's assassination by Savarkar and his followers. In Savarkar's vision of the Ramayana, Ravana, the evil one who had to be slain, would turn out to be Gandhi. And Gandhi, as he had hoped, would die with the name of the incarnation of God, Rama, on his lips, blessing his assassin. As Gandhi returned from London to the Satyagraha movement in South Africa, Savarkar conspired to carry out an assassination in India. In December 1909, a British magistrate in India, A.M.T. Jackson, who was about to depart from his post, was shot to death at a farewell party being held in his honor. The 16-year-old Assassin, Anant Kanhare, was tried and sentenced to death. The Browning pistol he had used to murder Jackson was traced back to Savarkar in London, who had smuggled it with other pistols through an intermediary into India. Britain's Bombay government sent a telegraphic warrant to London for Savarkar's arrest, charging him with sedition, distributing arms, and abetting the murder of Jackson. Savarkar surrendered to the authorities in London and was taken to Bombay, where he was tried and found guilty. In July 1911, he began serving a 50-year sentence in the cellular jail at Port Blair on the Andaman Islands, notorious for its harsh conditions. Before the year was over, Savarkar submitted a petition for clemency to the British. While Savarkar was begging the British for release from prison in the Andaman Islands, Gandhi was concluding his Satyagraha campaign in South Africa. 
When Gandhi moved back to India in 1914, he had to confront all over again the illogic of assassination. In 1915, Gandhi spoke to a huge gathering of militant students in Calcutta. He told the students that assassinations were absolutely a foreign growth in India. Those wanting to terrorize India should know, he said, that he would rise against them. Yet he recognized the courage beneath their commitment to terrorism, not in their willingness to kill, which he rejected, but in their willingness to die, which he was prepared to do himself in nonviolent resistance. He said, if I am for sedition, I must speak out for sedition. I must think out loud and take the consequences. If you are prepared to die, I am prepared to die with you. In the 1920s and 30s, Gandhi did toward, turn toward sedition against the British Empire, did openly advocate it, and was prepared to die in the process. The critical turning point in Gandhi's open sedition to the empire was his nationwide Satyagraha campaign initiated by the Salt March of 1930. When the 78 members of Gandhi's ashram marched with him for three weeks to the sea where he picked up a pinch of salt to break the British salt laws, a nonviolent signal was given to the entire nation. The people followed Gandhi's example with massive nonviolent civil disobedience. Yet Gandhi's signal would have meant nothing and there would have been no response to it had not he and the members of his community been willing to die, to do or die, <coughs> had they not been willing to carry out their nonviolent resistance through long prison terms, beatings, and death itself. Gandhi and his community's willingness to embrace death in loving resistance to the occupiers was the key to self-rule. In the summer of 1944, as the British were moving toward granting independence to India, Gandhi was harassed and threatened more than once by a group of men, some of whom would end up killing him three and a half years later. The men were disciples of Sabarkar, who was now freed from prison and had a new cadre of potential assassins. <coughs> Sabarkar's petitions for clemency from the British Empire had borne fruit for the empire's, as he put it, prodigal son, <clears throat> as he called himself in one such appeal for mercy at what he called the parental doors of the government. In 1921, Savarkar was brought back from the end of an island. In a less rigorous jail, Savarkar wrote what would become his best-known book. He wrote a number of books. Hindutva. What is a Hindu? An essay proclaiming his newly adopted Hindu nationalist ideology. After his release in 1924, Savarkar became a master propagandist for his violently anti-Muslim, culturally Hindu view of the world. The context of Gandhi's murder was that on January the 12th, 1948, Gandhi announced at his prayer meeting in Delhi that the next day he would begin a fast to death. He said, I yearn for heart friendship between Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims. Since the previous summer, Hindu, Sikhs, and Muslims had been slaughtering one another following the British government's partition in August 1947 of what had been one India and the two newly independent countries of India and Pakistan. Feeling impotent to stop the violence raging around him, Gandhi decided to fast, just as he had fasted for an end to Muslim-Hindu violence the previous September in Calcutta, where Muslims outnumbered Hindus, Gandhi now decided to fast in Delhi where Hindus outnumbered Muslims. The reconciling miracle that God had worked through his fast in Calcutta needed to be repeated in Delhi. He had to lay down his life all over again for reconciliation. 
Having become the Muslim's defender in India's Hindu-dominated capital, Gandhi found himself in deepening danger. The Hindu right had allied itself with elements of Gandhi's own Congress party. Savarkar's followers held cabinet and administrative positions in the government. Hindu extremists had also infiltrated India's security forces. Key police officials were more committed to an exclusively Hindu nation than they were to Gandhi's democratic ideal of a, di of a diverse, <coughs> secular nation. They could not be counted on to protect the life of a presumably pro-Muslim Satyagrahi when he was attacked by forces the police sympathized with. The state police provided the context of Gandhi's murder. Gandhi's Delhi fast for Hindu-Muslim unity in the wake of partition provided the rationale for a murderous decision already made by Savarkar and his disciples. Gandhi had been their target for years, but never had the time seemed more opportune for them to kill him. The assassins would now blame Gandhi for partition, seeking by propaganda justify their murdering him in an act as an act in defense of Hindu nationalism. Nathuram Godse and Narayan Apte would be Savarkar's lead assassins after assembling a team blessed and guided by their master. Godse was the editor and Apte the publisher of a newspaper in Pune called the Agrani, or as it was renamed, the Hindu Rashtra, that propagated Savarkar's militant Hinduism. Their relationship to Savarkar was one of total obedience. On the night of January 12, 1948, when Gotse and Abte read the announcement of Gandhi's fast from their teleprinter, they set January the 20th as their target date for murdering the Mahatma. On January the 13th, the first day of his fast, Gandhi said, I shall terminate the fast only when peace has returned to Delhi. If peace is restored to Delhi, it will have effect not only on the whole of India, but also on Pakistan. When that happens, a Muslim will be able to walk around in the city all by himself. On January the 14th, the second day of Gandhi's fast, Gotse and Apte traveled to Bombay, where they met Dingabar Badke, an armed salesman from whom they bought explosives and five hand grenades for their attempt on Gandhi's life. The three men went to Savarkar's home in Bombay. While Badke waited outside, Apte and Gaudse took the bag of explosives and hand grenades and went in to consult privately with Savarkar. The next day, Apte told Badke, Savarkar had decided that Gandhiji, Yawaharlal Nehru, and Hassan Shahid Surawardi who was a Muslim leader working with Gandhi, were to be finished off. And he had entrusted the work to Apte and Godse. On January the 16th, the fourth day of the fast, Gandhi's life was fading. He had been drinking no water and passing no urine. The physicians warned him that even if he survived the fast, he would suffer permanent serious injury. The next day in Bombay, Badge again accompanied Apte and Godse as far as the door of Savarkar, this time so the two assassination planners could seek his final blessing, as Godse said. Also on that fifth day of the fast, Gandhi's doctor warned in a bulletin, in our opinion it would be most undesirable to let the fast continue, therefore it is our duty to tell the people to take immediate steps to produce the requisite conditions for ending the fast without delay. In response, Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs came together in Delhi and formed processions of unity. One procession was over a mile long, numbering 100,000 participants. That night, 130 members of a central peace committee representing all communities assembled to adopt a pledge to convince Gandhi they had truly turned to peace. 
on the morning of January 18th, the sixth day, while Peace Committee representatives were signing their pledge to Gandhi, they received word that his condition had suddenly worsened. Over a hundred people crowded into Gandhi's room, packing the area around his bed. They told a revived Gandhi of the concrete steps already being taken to implement the peace pledge by Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and other communities. One after the other, they testified to the unity they were now committed to, begging him to give up his fast. Looking around the circle of anxious faces, Gandhi said they had given him all I asked for. Nevertheless, he questioned them skeptically. Did they understand the implications of their pledge? And at 12.25 p.m. January the 18th, Gandhi received a glass of orange juice from his Muslim ally, Abdul Azad, and began sipping it, breaking his final fast. On January the 20th, Apte, Godse, Badge, and four other conspirators met in a room of the Marina Hotel in Delhi. They went over their plans to murder Gandhi at his prayer meeting that afternoon. Apte gave them their final instructions. Conspirator Madeline Pawa was to explode a bomb on a rear wall to panic the crowd. As soon as the bomb went off and confusion erupted, two of them would shoot Gandhi, while the other five would throw hand grenades at him from only a few feet away. Gandhi remained so weak from his fast that he had to be carried to the prayer meeting on a chair. When he spoke to the gathering, his voice was feeble. He talked of his disciples, Nehru and Patel, the two head ministers of the government. Everyone, Gandhi felt, should know that these two leaders were united in their respect for Muslims. You should remember, Gandhi said, that he who is an enemy of Muslims is an enemy of India. From the audience, Apte then signaled Pawa to begin the assassination scenario. The young man obediently ignited the fuse for the explosive charge in the back wall. A deafening explosion shook the prayer ground. Gandhi raised his hand. He gestured to the crowd to calm down. The people returned to their places. The two shooters had developed cold feet. They did nothing. The other conspirators were paralyzed. Witnesses who saw Pawa light the fuse pointed him out to the police. While Pawa was, was being arrested, all six of his co-conspirators melted into the crowd and escaped. Gandhi said afterwards, no one should blame the young man who was arrested. Quote, he had taken it for granted that I am an enemy of Hinduism. When he says he was doing the bidding of God, he is only making God an accomplice in a wicked deed. But it cannot be so. Therefore, those who are behind him, or whose tool he is, should know that this sort of thing will not save Hinduism. As in Dingra's assassination of Curzon Wiley in 1909, Gandhi knew the real responsibility for the crime lay in the shadows, as in fact it did, in a conspiracy inspired in both cases by the same man, Vinayak Sabarkar. Gandhi was under no illusion that Pawa's arrest meant the threat was over. When he was told a co-worker had said the explosion at the prayer meeting might turn out to have been nothing but a harmless prank, Gandhi laughed at the thought. He exclaimed, the fool! Don't you see there is a terrible and widespread conspiracy behind it? While his co-workers went about their business, Gandhi prepared to meet his death. Nathuram Godse and Narayan Apte returned to Bombay where they succeeded in reunited with the closest co-conspirator Vishnu Karkare. At a Delhi police station, Pawa soon confessed the entire plot to his interrogators. In describing each of his six companions, he said one of them was the editor of the Pune newspaper, Hindu Rashtra or Agrani. What 
could have been a definitive identification of Nathuram Godse. The importance of this evidence on Gandhi's would-be assassins was underlined by a chilling statement Madden Law Pawa made to the police. He kept saying, they will come again. Nathuram Godse in the com company of Apte and Karkare would fulfill Pawa's prophecy to the poli police by shooting Gandhi to death on January the 30th. How could that happen? Incriminating, identifying information was in the hands of the police. Powell was warning them that the killers <coughs> would return. Moreover, Madden Law Powell had already divulged the plot to kill Gandhi the week before the conspirators even tried to carry it out. He had told his employer in Bombay, Professor J.C. Jane, about his upcoming role, as he called it, throwing a bomb, as a diversion at Gandhi's prayer meeting so that his associates could kill Gandhi. Jane thought Powell was just making up the story until he was shocked to read a January the 21st newspaper article about Powell's arrest for the bombing incident. Jane then managed to meet with B.G. Kerr, Premier of the province of Bombay and Maraji Desai, the Home Minister of the province of Bombay. He succeeded in informing the two most important government officials in Bombay on the urgent matter of Gandhi's impending assassination over a week before it would happen. As of January the 21st, both the Delhi police and the Bombay police had in their possession statements identifying key members of the ongoing conspiracy to kill Gandhi. Moreover, they were in touch with each other. Yet for nine days, the assassins moved about freely until three of them, Apte, Godse, and Karkare, returned on the 30th to another prayer meeting in Delhi where Godse then killed Gandhi. For that to happen without any intervening arrest to prevent the assassination, strange events had to occur, and they did. On January the 21st, Delhi's Inspector General of Police, T.G. Sanjevi, sent two of his officers to Bombay to brief the Bombay Deputy Police Commissioner, Mr. Nagarvala, on Pawa's confession. The Delhi officers claimed that when they saw the Bombay Commissioner, Nagarvala, on the next two days, he met with them only perfunctorily. The officers, in turn, told the commissioners the commissioner, nothing they knew that would identify the assassins. Nor did Nagarvala share with them the contents of the statement he already had from Professor Jane. Each police contingent acted as if it were obliged not to speak in a meaningful way, each claiming later that the other was to blame for Gandhi's death. <laughs> On January the 25th, when Gandhi had five days left to live, Pawa had by this time said that not only the editor of the Hindu Rashtra, who happened to be Godse, but also its proprietor or publisher, who happened to be Apte, were his co-conspirators. When it came to identifying by name the editor and proprietor of the Hindu Rashtra, the ignorance and disinterest of the police officials became even more puzzling. It was discovered later that the Indian government had this information in its own files in Delhi all along. Inspector General Sanjevi was also the director of the Intelligence Bureau, the highest police job in India. For the ten days from Pawa's capture to Gandhi's assassination, the government's official list of newspapers that identified Godse and Apte as the editor and publisher of the Hindu Rashtra was only a few steps away from, from Sanjevi in his own files. He never took those steps, nor did any other police official. And so it went. In a police investigation marked by indifference toward tracking and arresting the men who were stalking Gandhi, Pawa said they would come back, and they did. The police, by their inaction, gave the assassins another chance. Why? 
The veil was lifted for a moment when Nagarvala was asked later why he did not arrest Savarkar or detain him. He said, I could not do so before the murder as that would not only have caused commotion in the region, but an upheaval. Just before Gandhi fell asleep on his final night, in a conversation with one of his attendants, he said once again that if he was, as he put it, the man of God that he claimed to be, he would have to respond to his assassin by breathing God's name. If someone were to end my life, he said, by putting a bullet through me, as someone tried to do with a bomb the other day, and I met his bullet without a groan and breathed my last, taking God's name, then alone would I have made good my claim. On Friday, January 30th, Gandhi's last day on earth, as he left his quarters for his prayer meeting, <clears throat> there were leaders outside requesting an appointment with him. He said, tell them to come after prayer. I shall see them if I am alive. As Gandhi finished walking across the grass to the prayer ground, he was silent, with his hands resting on the shoulders of his grandnieces, Abba and Manu. He ascended the six brick steps to the terrace that was his prayer site. Manu has described the next moments. Then, lifting his hands off our shoulders, he folded them to greet the assembled people and walked on. I was walking on his right. From the same direction, a stout young man in khaki dress with his hands folded pushes, his, pushed his way through the crowd and came near us. The man in khaki was Nathuram Godse. As Manu tried to push past him, saying, Bapu is already ten minutes late, Godse shoved her out of the way. Manu bent down to pick up the rosary she had dropped. Godse was bowing to Gandhi. Raising his head, he pulled out an automatic pistol and fired three quick shots, one into Gandhi's stomach and two into his chest. As Gandhi fell, blessing his assassin, his last words were, Rama, Rama. Gandhi's great-grandson, Tushar Gandhi, has written about police complicity in the assassination According to a secret report submitted to Home Minister Sardar Patel, many in the police force and many bureaucrats were secret members of Savarkar's Hindu nationalist organizations, the RSS and the Hindu Mahasabha, and were actively supporting and promoting the ideology of the Hindu extremist organizations. The measures taken by the police between the 20th and 30th of January 1948 were more to ensure the smooth progress of the murderers than to try and prevent Gandhi's murder. In hindsight, it can only be said that in Gandhi's murder, the police, by their negligence and inaction, were as much guilty as the murderers themselves. Savarkar was among those charged with Gandhi's murder. Dingambar Badge, who turned state's evidence, testified in the murder trial about Godse's and Apte's meetings with Savarkar. However, Savarkar was found not guilty because of a lack of corroborative evidence. Godse and Apte protected Savarkar all the way to their executions, denying vehemently any connection with Savarkar in the conspiracy. Savarkar read a 57-page statement in his defense. In it, he told the story of his life, portraying himself as a self-sacrificing patriot. He flatly denied all the charges against him. In conclusion, <clears throat> wiping tears from his cheeks, he cited statements he had made that he claimed showed his admiration and affection for Gandhi. Although Savarkar was seated next to Godse in the defendant's dock, he totally ignored him and the other defendants. 
Yet critics have maintained that Savarkar, in spite of his public coldness toward Godse, was actually the composer of Godse's surprisingly <coughs> eloquent written statement. It took Godse nine hours to deliver his courtroom speech. Why did the judge give Godse a courtroom platform from which he could launch an extended attack on the reputation of the man he had already shot to death. When Godse and in effect Savarkar were allowed to attack Gandhi in a nine-hour courtroom diatribe, the defendants became the prosecution. It was a clear prelude to Savarkar being declared not guilty by the judge. It was only after Savarkar's death in 1966 that a government commission headed by Justice J. L. Kapoor <coughs> revealed that the corroborative evidence to convict Savarkar had been in the government's possession all along. Three months before the Gandhi murder trial began, Savarkar's bodyguard, Appa Ramchandra Kassar, and his secretary, Gajanan Vishnu Damle, gave recorded statements to the Bombay police confirming that meetings between Savarkar, Godse, and Apte had in fact taken place before the assassination. When summarizing the evidence tying Savarkar into the blot, Justice Kapoor stated in his report, all these facts taken together were destructive of any theory other than the conspiracy to murder Gandhi by Savarkar and his group. Yet prosecutors never called to the murder trials witness stand either Savarkar's bodyguard, Kassar, or his secretary, Damle. Their testimony would have closed the government's conspiracy case against Savarkar. So why did the government hold back critical evidence that would have convicted Savarkar? Tushar Gandhi concluded that Savarkar was acquitted because of political necessity. He said, Patel had admitted that the government had uh, already annoyed the Muslims and we could not afford to anger the Hindus too. If Savarkar had been found guilty and sentenced, it would have caused a massive Hindu extremist reaction, which the Congress party <coughs> was scared of facing. Savarkar's purpose was not simply to kill Gandhi. It was above all to destroy his vision. Gandhi's vision was a powerful, nonviolent alternative to Hindu militancy. A truly successful assassination had to destroy a vision that was more inspiring than Savarkar's. Because of the very power of Satyagraha, which could transform India into a nonviolent catalyst in the world, Savarkar and his followers thought it had to be destroyed. Yet Savarkar was shrewd enough to know he couldn't attack Gandhi's vision head on. He could only hope to cover it up, just as he strove to cover up his role in Gandhi's assassination. Savarkar had shown himself to be a master assassin and propagandist four decades earlier in London. After his follower, Madanlal Dingra, carried out his command by murdering Curzon Wiley, Savarkar wrote, Dingra's posthumously published <coughs> statement. It inspired anti-British statements at the same time as it shielded Savarkar from blame in killing Wiley. He accomplished the same kind of feat in Gandhi's murder and the conspirator's trial. After inspiring and manipulating Gandhi's assassination from behind the scenes, Savarkar shunned his disciples in the courtroom defended himself as an admirer of Gandhi and was declared not guilty of all the charges against him. The Thurm Godse delivered an eloquent courtroom attack against the murder victim, Gandhi, that was inspired by Savarkar and probably written by him. Then, denying their master's involvement in the conspiracy, um, they went to their deaths, and Savarkar walked out of the courtroom a free assassin. As Patel and Nehru should have learned from Gandhi's insistence that the truth is always paramount, 
<clears throat> their government's unwillingness to preserve the truth in his death would not lay a solid foundation for the country. The newly independent government's deliberate failure to convict Savarkar of Gandhi's murder gave Savarkar's followers a freer hand in revising his image. Since Savarkar's <laughs> own death in 1966, a broader movement has risen from his ideology. Nehru's rejection of Gandhi's legacy was completed by his support by the, for the secret development of nuclear weapons for India. Nehru worked secretly with his longtime Indian Atomic Energy Commission Chairman, Homi Baba, to research and develop India's capacity to make an atomic bomb. When India actually exploded its first nuclear bomb on May 18, 1974, a decade after Nehru's death, at the order of his equally pro-nuclear daughter, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, his atomic legacy triumphed tragically over his teacher Gandhi's nonviolent hope for <coughs> India as an instrument for world peace. Once Gandhi was assassinated, the father of the country, who sought a radically different future for India, was gone. The nonviolent vision Gandhi opened up to the country was based on a power his old disciples, India's new rulers, could not accept unless they were willing to reject the kind of nation state handed over to them by the British. Gandhi's nonviolent vision of Swaraj, would have, which had brought them independence, was incompatible with the rise of their own national security state. Their contradiction is our own. Gandhi's nonviolent revolution of the poor, non cooperating with the enemy while loving him all the way to a new future, is a truth we have not yet realized. Nor we, can we realize that truth so long as we accept its antithesis a national security state protecting our affluence and dominated by nuclear weapons. In his experiments in truth, Gandhi discovered an alternative to revolutionary terrorism and state terrorism. Satyagraha Truth Force was based on a harmony of means and ends. Gandhi said there was the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as between the seed and the tree. Gandhi and Savarkar posed two radical choices in opposing state power in the nuclear age, satyagraha or terrorism. Gandhi's and Savarkar's visions of satyagraha and terrorism, assassination and martyrdom competed, and today compete with greater urgency for the future of India, the USA, and the world. Gandhi's death dramatized his commitment to a vision that included yet transcended India, in his long journey that ended with his assassination, Gandhi sought God in the hearts of his enemies, including those who wanted to kill him. He chose to see his assassins as friends. They were, first of all, children of God. The trigger men he pointed out in previous attempts on his life were acting on the mistaken belief that they were doing the will of God. Even those who inspired them, or who gave them orders to kill, were not his main concern. Gandhi's real enemies, he knew, were not the trigger men, not the plotters, not even the ideologists, ideologists of violence, but the unspeakable cultural forces that they all obeyed as their gods. Gandhi believed that all of us, no exceptions, could be liberated from our own violent prison by experiments in a universal power of truth and love. Gandhi's deepening willingness to confront his assassins with love was his last testament to us on the meaning of nonviolence. His final experiment in truth was his death. So, if you'd like to share something, that'd be good.
I believe that what we did was pass out some three by three by five cards. No, we're just taking questions. Oh, we're just taking questions. Okay, great, fine. Uh, you can handle those cards if you want me up here. That's fine. What led you to writing this book? Um, well, it's not really a book yet. <laughs> um, I was trying to write about <clears throat> the assassinations of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. <clears throat> and I couldn't do it without writing about Gandhi first. It wasn't... Um, <clears throat> It wasn't like I, I had decided to write anything about Gandhi. I found the mentions of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, both of them in Gandhi, and I found um, analogies to their assassinations in Gandhi's. And I could not get started on <laughs> my my given project uh, by my editor publisher until I wrote about Gandhi. And it was not to uh, my uh, friend Robert El Ellsberg's pleasure. He said, well, Jim, you're doing Gandhi next. Is Lincoln to follow? <laughs> and um, I said, no. Um, so I, there, there um, is something going on here I think, in Gandhi's assassination that prefigures what's going to happen to us in the USA in the 1960s. <clears throat> and it's very important because here, here we have in India a great nonviolent movement. And then into its midst comes the victory and suddenly, a national security state, which is headed by two of Gandhi's key people, Nehru and Patel. So we have an incredible kind of contradiction going on that maybe illustrates some of the contradictions in our situation that are harder to see in our own context. Um, the kind of uh, ways in which um, Savarkar manipulated um, key people and lied and, um, and the ways in which um, he managed to avoid responsibility is not so dissimilar <laughs> from the ways in which Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are assassinated. And the ways in which the state police <laughs> are complicit in the assassination of Gandhi and the ways in which the state police have been infiltrated by um, people and forces and um, powers that are supportive of Gandhi's assassination is not at all dissimilar from what happens in our context. So we're getting a preview of what's going to happen to Malcolm and Martin in a situation which is distinct from ours in many ways, and yet when it comes to a national security state that is on its way to becoming a nuclear power, there are some very strong similarities. Thanks. Jim, yes. what is to keep us from being um, depressed into inaction with these kinds of things? Because we know it exists today. Yes in so many ways, in so many places, that this force that doesn't want peace and compassion and people living in dignity to happen for whatever reason, what's to keep us from just giving up? What's to keep us from not giving up? <laughs> What I think is true um, in Dr. King's vision uh, when he talks about, you know, the arc of the 
universe bending toward justice and and Gandhi when he speaks about truth force um, is so profoundly visible in the world today we don't have to look very far from the headlines of the newspaper yesterday and today that I think we've got a lot of hope happening right now and the hope is harder when you're in the <laughs> when you're in the middle of the situation and the context where we are in the United States of America. Um, I think the greatest hope comes from a faith that is embodied in community, communities of nonviolence, in which people are willing to take exactly the same kind of risks that Gandhi took. Jim, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, everybody hearing your point of view about it, uh, Gandhi was willing to say that in some contexts, violence was an acceptable, although a lesser good, an acceptable way to respond to, uh, let's say, attacks upon innocence or uh, the termination of a very painful life uh, and uh, resisting a thief. Uh, what did he mean by that? Well, he didn't talk in those terms. Okay. <laughs> but he did talk <clears throat> in terms of um, acknowledging that whereas on the other, on the one hand, there was always an alternative to violence. There was always a creative way to respond to any kind of situation which was nonviolent. He felt that his own limitations or anybody's limitations might um, fall short of that and as we were discussing at lunch, <laughs> um, that um, it was better, it was better to resist violently than to be passive in the face of, of an evil. He, he was a person who did not believe in passivity. <laughs> and he did not believe in the acceptance of injustice, that that was the ultimate kind of violence. So that's, I think, what uh, the places where he would um, accept um, the necessity of responding. Well, there is no such thing as a totally nonviolent action, and he he worked from very uh, immediate recognition of that. So on the scale, this, on the scale of values, he saw more value to resisting violently an act of injustice or an act of violence than being passive. That's the kind of way he spoke. It wasn't sort of a calculus kind of thing. It was um, really an insistence upon what we might call a militant nonviolence, which Dr. King had also absolutely strong So the thing he most objected to was the failure to resist injustice. Yes. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. <laughs> You've uh, titled your research about Gandhi, uh, Gandhi and the Unspeakable, which is awesome. Uh -huh. Yes. The same as you titled your the JFK book. Could yes. You, uh, to explain the link. Well, the unspeakable 
is Thomas Merton's term um, from his his work uh, Raids on the Unspeakable and he talks about it uh, it comes from the context of the 60s <clears throat> where he is um, in the midst of the Vietnam War the um, nuclear arms race and the ongoing assassinations of Malcolm and Martin and uh, JFK and RFK <clears throat> and he he speaks about the kind of uh, evil that goes almost beyond the capacity of speech and that um, we, the, the quickest way to summarize it is to say we don't want to go there. Nobody wants to go there. That's the unspeakable. Not only that we don't want to say it, we don't want to go there in, in terms of our eyes, in terms of our heart, <coughs> in terms of um, <clears throat> our already being there. We don't want to go there. And um, nobody wanted to go there in terms of Gandhi's assassination. There have been, well, that's, it's a lot of years now since Gandhi's assassination in India. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and at the time that it occurred, there was a lot of covering up going on, and even for the assassination to occur, there had to be state complicity uh, to allow it to happen. Gandhi saw that going on around him. And the people that we're more familiar with in the 60s, perhaps, they saw the same things going on around them. And that's the unspeakable that, that I think Merton was referring to. Thank you. Gandhi, um, his greatest challenge to me <clears throat> is the way in which he reached toward even his most virul virulent or profoundly opposed opponents. He did things that I could hardly believe um, in the final stages of his life. Um, I'm thinking especially in his relation to um, Jinnah, um, who became the leader of, of Pakistan and was the, <clears throat> the person who was in a way, the deepest thorn in, in Gandhi's side in some of the final months of his life. Gandhi met with Jinnah time after time after time um, to try to work th through a way in which India could remain as a whole. <clears throat> and without Jinnah's knowledge, when the new viceroy of India, Lord Mountbatten, came to <coughs> India in the final stages of um, the, what would result in partition and the declaration of, of uh, the new country of Pakistan and the, the newly independent country of India. Gandhi proposed to Mountbatten in their talks that in order to prevent the partition of India and Pakistan, that the first Prime Minister of India become Jinnah. Nehru, when he heard about that, couldn't believe it. Of course, that meant Nehru would not be the, the leader. And Gandhi felt that if one could go to the point of giving that, putting that much faith in the person who had become the primary obstacle to everyone on the Congress side, on the um, you know in the in the party of the um, of the political in the political party that Gandhi had been basically the leader of for all the independence movement, if they could extend that act of faith in him, that India could remain together. And a number of people who later 
um, understood this proposal or even then felt that Gandhi was right. Jinnah didn't know what, had, what was going on. And he never, he never was told during that time, so he didn't have the opportunity to accept it. But this was Gandhi's greatest enemy at that time in terms of the political vision of Gandhi, and he was willing to extend that act of faith nonviolently in the belief he had in Muhammad Ali Jinnah. I, I was just overwhelmed by learning that. I want to thank Jim, uh, especially for his research and his presentation to us. We have a special, this is the first time we've ever offered it, gift for Jim for the uh, uh, for being the Peacemaker of the Year. It's um, handcrafted from Brazil, little jade pieces uh, here, fair trade. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's an olive tree. Perhaps we know that from when the olive tree is first uh, planted. It's between 70 and 80 years before it begins to give fruit. It's a, it's a long-term process, which is one of the reasons that it's a symbol for peacemaking. Violence is very quick. You just pull a gun out and shoot people and that's it, pretty much. But healing and peacemaking <coughs> takes a great deal of time and creativity. And of course, it's, it's quite beautiful and quite nourishing in many different ways, the olive plant. And in this particular one, is actually growing on a rock. So you can see how much, how sturdy and how persistent you have to be to be a peacemaker. And so we're very proud to say thank you to Jim and present him this from the Center for Peace.